Well, gre greetings, everybody, and welcome to this next edition of Marine Money's climate-focused webinar series, sponsored and supported by the High Tide Foundation in its continuing commitment to battling the ravages and threats of climate change. It's particularly exciting for those of us here in New York City region uh, this week, as it marks the start of the United Nations General Assembly and focus on Climate Week as a particular area of, of concern. And with it, it brings a vast assortment of uh, either in-person or virtual meetings across really every industrial sector, cities, uh, you know, uh, indus industries, uh, different approaches and technologies, all committed in their own way to the united fight to save our planet. For those of us in the shipping industry, while we have miles to go before we sleep, we should feel especially proud that the Global Maritime Forum has convened their meeting of our industry's thought leaders and principles to coincide with the UN's efforts and activities. So welcome to New York Global Maritime Forum. This consequential linkage demonstrates our industry's united and global commitment to the battle and underscores what industry can do by itself but it also reinforces our call to governments and regulators insisting they follow our lead and support us in each and every step of the way. We're joined today by seven individuals who have profoundly impacted our efforts and for whom I have the utmost time and respect. They bring each bring a, a different contribution to the fight and they each have thoughtfully and deliberately brought focus to the effort. To lead our discussions, it's a privilege to introduce a good friend, Hal Malone, who this week celebrates one year at the helm of climate confronting ETF BC. I will let Hal describe BC, but I will say that it's focus on companies whose own focus is on the trillion dollar transition to zero emissions and clean ocean technologies, aligns his thinking squarely with those we are privileged to hear from next. Hal, thank you for joining us, and thank all of you for joining us, both on screen and outside over there. And congratulations, uh, Hal, on the VC's first year. Over to you. Thank you, uh, thank you, Jim. Oh, let me get. Uh, thank you, Jim, and it's my privilege to be with everyone here today, and honor to lead uh, a session with such uh, distinguished speakers during a critical week in New York. As Jim mentioned, we are celebrating this week BC's one year anniversary in conjunction with both UN Climate Week and the GMF event here in New York. For those not familiar with BC, it is a New York Stock Exchange listed ETF, which invests in the equity securities of a diversified set of global companies that develop technologies, manufacture equipment, or provide services related to marine or ocean decarbonization. BC tracks the Marine Money Decarbonization Index, and we also published a decarbonization investment survey during Marine Money Week earlier this year that we would be happy to share with anyone interested. So why did uh, we create um, the MMDI in BC? I think everyone in today's audience appreciates the first three uh, boxes that we show here as challenges. The large and diverse nature of the industry, its substantial contribution to global carbon emissions, and the technology uh, challenges it faces in uh, its uh, journey to decarbonize. But on the positive side, we see a range of trailblazing companies from around the world that are emerging with exciting new technologies, alternative fuels, and other solutions. Many of these companies are existing industry players, but many are also new startups or from specialized fields outside of the traditional maritime supply chain and unknown to many industry participants. This complexity makes it difficult even for large industry players to track. There are seemingly new projects announced every week, if not almost every day. We even find it a challenge to stay current with a dedicated analyst team that tracks and researches the companies and developments full time. So you can imagine how complicated this is for players outside of the industry to follow and to identify appropriate investment opportunities. So we created MMDI to provide a reference benchmark and partnered with ETFMG to make it investable to the average investor via a New York Stock Exchange listed ETF. What is in uh, both the MMDI and BC? They're both composed of public companies from around the world that develop technologies, manufacture equipment, or provide services related to ocean and maritime decarbonization. This includes companies that provide propulsion solutions, are developing green fuels and related infrastructure, offer onboard systems and software solutions, or focus on offshore energy development. To give a bit more context, 
Uh, here's a list of uh, the 20 core names, which are uh, the majority of the investment of the 44 companies that are currently included in the index. It's interesting to look at the diversity of the names, as well as the diversity of uh, the listing venue. Uh, with uh, Norway and US uh, leading and uh, a balance of core companies mostly concentrated in other European exchanges. Um, we do believe that the industry is at a very early stage of its investment cycle. And we believe in creating what we think is a compelling investment thesis that we've opened this opportunity to the full range of investors, both in the US and abroad, and are excited to be part of uh, the journey. With that, um, I'll now transition on to uh, the other esteemed speakers we have today. Uh, we hope to have time for Q&A following each of the presentations. So feel free to uh, submit any questions you have into the uh, chat feature. And I'm sure to the extent uh, we don't have a chance to get to all of them uh, during the session today, that uh, either uh, Marine Money or the speakers can follow up directly afterwards. Our first uh, speaker, uh, who I see is now just joined on screen, uh, is uh, Mr. Hawkey Kite Powell, who comes to us from the respected uh, Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, where climate change and ocean studies have been front and center from uh, long before these were household discussions, both in the US and around the world. He's also a senior analyst at Marsoft and uh, brought his passion and skills to their uh, green screen project that we'll hear more about later. With that, uh, Hawkey. Thank you very much, Hal, and thank you everyone for joining this conversation today. Uh, the oceans play a critical role in the global climate system. And uh, without their uh, uptake of greenhouse gases, CO2, uh, that humanity has put into the atmosphere and their uptake of heat from the atmosphere, our climate would be much worse today for us than it is. The Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution has a long record as mentioned, of studying how the oceans work and is dedicated to understanding the role that they can play in helping us navigate the climate issues that are ahead. The institution also has a long history of collaboration with the shipping industry uh, in the collection of data necessary to support that understanding of the oceans. All the recent science and weather events that we've experienced in the past year or two have shown us that the climate model predictions that have been in the scientific uh, literature for decades now uh, are, if anything, conservative in forecasting the dramatic changes that greenhouse gas concentrations are likely to bring. Even at the current level of warming, which is about 1.1 degrees Celsius from pre-industrial levels, we're seeing dramatic changes in natural systems. And our current policies have us on course for as much as three degrees warming by the end of the century. And that kind of warming we now understand with increasing clarity dramatically raises the risk of reaching tipping points in natural systems such as ice sheets and permafrost in the northern latitudes. Those tipping points are uh, scientific concepts of natural systems taking on a dynamic of their own once they reach a certain level of warming um, and become self-reinforcing, worsening the climate situation further. On the trajectory that we're currently on for three degrees warming, we are effectively in the process of stealing, and I don't think that's too strong a word, through the climate-related losses that we are imposing on them from our grandchildren and great-grandchildren, a significant portion of the wealth that they can expect to generate in their lifetimes. The climate matters to economic activity and economic wealth around the world. For most of us, I suspect in this webinar today and our families, 
that's not going to be a matter of life and death. We have the resources to manage that kind of challenge. But for many others, especially in the developing parts of the world, it is exactly that, a matter of life and death, uh, particularly when we look to the likely effects in the second half of this century. And so I think we are all called on to do more to get us off this trajectory, including everyone who is like us in the shipping world. There's a lot of technology development underway, as you know, a lot of regulatory movement, a lot of acronyms, uh, EEDI and XI and CII and ETS uh, from the IMO and the EU and, and no shortage of things underway. But really where the real change comes is when ship owners make concrete investments to make their fleets and their operations more fuel efficient and reduce their carbon footprint. And it is to support exactly that sort of activity, that sort of investment, that initiatives like the green screen process that you'll hear about here today have been put in place. So with that brief introduction, uh, I'm going to hand back to Hal. Thanks, uh, Halky. Uh, maybe if you wouldn't mind just taking another minute or two and, and share a bit more about uh, the Woods Hole um, Oceanographic Institution and uh, how it works with or seeks to work with the, with the industry to uh, uh, accomplish its objectives. Sure. Um, the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution was founded uh, more than 90 years ago to further the understanding of how the oceans work. Uh, we are a team of about a thousand people located in Woods Hole, Massachusetts. And uh, we operate around the world to do uh, scientific research and explore the oceans uh, in, in their biological, chemical, physical uh, dimensions, the geology of the seafloor and in particular, the role that the ocean plays in climate. And a lot of that involves data collection, taking measurements uh, of physical parameters, chemical parameters uh, at the surface and in the deeper uh, parts of the ocean. The collaboration with the shipping industry has been extremely fruitful uh, in that we've been able to place automatic data collection devices on a number of ships of opportunity uh, typically ships that transect the same course over and over again on a regular schedule and allow us to get really good uh, data sets of how conditions are changing along those routes. These things are uh, highly automated. They don't require any real overhead on the part of the ship owner or operator, uh, and they generate very valuable data. And if any of you are interested in participating in that, uh, we'd be happy to connect you with the right people. Great. Well, uh, Hawkey, thank you for uh, your uh, comments here today and everything that you and the Woods Hole uh, Institution uh, do uh, for, uh, for the good of our planet. And uh, uh, with that, I'll ask uh, our next two uh, speakers, uh, Arlie and Erica, if they could join and wish you uh, all the best, Hawkey. Thank you. Right. Um, for, uh, for those of us committed to uh, shipping decarbonization, one of the most exciting developments in 2022 has been the collaboration between Marsoft and Climco to uh, hopefully accelerate the pace of emissions reduction in shipping. This collaboration brings together two, pow two powerhouses, Marsoft, which is well known in the industry for its successful investment and risk management services, and Climco, a market maker in the carbon credits origination and trading space. So we're very fortunate to have with us today, Arlie Sterling, who's the head of Marsoft's Green Screen Retrofit Initiative, and Erica Schiller, who's a VP at Climco, to share more about how their collaboration is turbocharging Marsoft's Green Screen Retrofit Funding Program, making that initiative uh, an innovative service even more attractive to ship owners. With that, I'll turn it over to uh, Arlie and uh, Eric. 
Al, thank you so much for that introduction. And, and uh, we're really excited to be here, excited to be part of the UN Climate Week and all that the maritime industry is doing to contribute to the success of, of decarbonization. Um, we're here in, in this particular program, we, we, we've been asked to talk about improving fleets EEXI and CII scores. And so I'm gonna talk, we're gonna talk about what those scores mean, how they're motivating change and how we can help move people in that in the right direction. The IMO has created EEXI and CII and numerous other indicators as, as we heard from Hauke as a scorecard to help show how your ships are performing, how the industry as a whole is reducing its CO2 uh, footprint. And weak EEXI scores or CII scores can have significant adverse commercial consequences. Now, if, of course, if you fail to meet the EEXI requirements, your ship can't trade. If you have a poor CII score, it's likely to limit your access to capital, to limit your attractiveness to charters, to maybe make it impossible to get long-term charters. So scoring well uh, by the IMO standards is very important. There are two main classes of strategies that the industry has chosen to improve their scores. One is to slow the ships down or to reduce their maximum speed in the case of EEXI, to reduce their average speed in the case of a CII, or to optimize the voyage, to, to in effect manage the CII by increasing voyage lengths and minimizing time in port. That first strategy is relatively inexpensive in terms of upfront cost, but it has significant adverse commercial consequences. It's likely to make the ship less competitive, less appealing to charters, less valuable. And so although it's cheap to take these steps, it has limited impact, it has the likely to adverse impact, on the value and earnings profile of the fleet. As an alternative to slowing down, or perhaps complementing that in some cases, owners are looking to retrofit to improve their vessel performance. And there are lots of new opportunities emerging uh, in that regard. And some of the things that Hal referred to are really important, but opening up new opportunities to improve the efficiency of the fleet. <clears throat> but there's a lot of basic blocking and tackling that can be done that doesn't require uh, expensive and is so far unproven technology, we can improve the performance of, of vessels, of the fuel consumption of vessels by 10% or more. And we've done extensive work with the vessels to, to demonstrate that before and after uh, performance uh, improvement. But the trouble is retrofitting a vessel is expensive. It takes time out of the, uh, the, 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 the vessel's opportunity to trade, so have to put new equipment on board, we have to put new coding. And so the upfront financial cost is a barrier. And it's very unlikely the charters are gonna pay for that upfront cost. That's the problem that Marsoft and Climco set out to solve by introducing our new green screen, enhanced green screen services that provide in effect retrofit funding with gold standard credentials. The it's not the, the path to, to retrofit funding that green screen helps our, our clients with is through the voluntary carbon markets. And the voluntary carbon markets are a demanding market to, to raise money in. It's like issuing an investment grade bond. It's hard to meet the standards, it's time consuming. And those facts have been a barrier in the past to ship owners taking advantage of the funding opportunities. Those are the problems we've solved with our green screen turnkey solution. I'm gonna talk about the first step and a half in that process, then turn it over to Erica to take it from there. As a first part to demonstrate to the voluntary carbon markets that your retrofits are in fact going to deliver the CO2 emissions reductions that they're promised, you have to go through something called the carbon registry. And in our case, we work with the gold standard carbon registry. We've worked with MIT and we've worked with the, the gold standard to implement a methodology which eliminates the cost and time required 
to verify the expected savings. And of course, to have that methodology uh, 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 built into the gold standards routine for issuing carbon credits. Now that methodology not only works up front, but it yields significant value in the issuance process. So once you get your, your projects going, started at, uh, the, at the gold standard, they will follow and monitor the progress of the operations of your ships in order to confirm that the emissions reductions have been delivered. And it's that critical step that precedes the issuance of the credits. The approach we developed, again, developed in collaboration with the MIT Sea Grant Design Lab, greatly speeds up that process and simplifies the process of, of gathering the data, another big barrier to entry, which we've eliminated with green screen. And at that point, we turn it over to Climco. And Erica, I'll do that. I'll, I'll turn it over to you today to, to go through the next steps. All right, great. So thank you, Arlie. And it's a pleasure to be here today to talk about the collaboration that we started. I think we started talking about it last year, but uh, finally finalized and announced this summer. And, um, you know, for Climco, we have been in the hard to abate sector for a long time with industrial gases and cement and, you know, ammonia. And we work with a lot of large uh, industrial players. And so we actually thought shipping was kind of a natural next step um, because of the huge challenges to reduce emissions and, and meet net zero targets in this large and hard to abate sector. Um, so working with Marsoft, we, um, you know, Climco works in the in the carbon space. We do project development and um, we create the issue. We create the offsets and then we work with the registries to um, to even write new methodologies. But in this case, what we're doing together is when we gather the data from the ship owners, we, we aggregate to you know, reduce the cost. So it's not each ship owner has to pay for the verification for their ships. Um, or Gold Standard has a program of activity. So you can group many ship owners together to reduce the overall costs, reduce the overhead and burden to the project. And then we will, uh, so we issue the credits through gold standard and then our carbon services teams, our transactions team um, leads the effort in branding these uh, credits and uh, monetizing them through all of the direct uh, relationships that we already have with large corporates. Um, so it's a really, it's a, a low friction kind of uh, transactions uh, path. And we've actually already seen some strong interest in this type of credit because there really are very few uh, voluntary offsets in the ocean space in general. And, and a lot of um, large corporates are discovering that um, they're, they're all shipping things, they're moving products and they're having a hard time figuring out how to reduce those emissions in the shipping sector. So that's a fun challenge that we've been working on together. And, and we really think that the, the green screen program and our collaboration uh, will help you know, fund those decarbonization activities and the retrofitting and um, re reduce the barriers and, um, and, and bring more uh, climate improvements through that scaling. So on, on this slide, you know, what we wanted to show is that um, Carbon offsets, as I mentioned, they they really need some scale. There are there's overhead costs. There are um, there are registration fees. There are um, you know verification fees, and because of that, you really you really need scale. And so so what we're doing is we're we're working together to talk to many ship owners across the world, really, to um, explain to them how the green screen program makes the the, the modeling of these retrofits uh, smoother and simpler and, uh, and the funding that um, voluntary transactions or voluntary carbon can um, help bring to make those economic decisions easier and to, to get those returns so that you, you can invest in these aging vessels. Um, so, you know, we have a team that specializes, my team is in project development and we specialize in, in new methodologies and, um, and working with our registries to quantify and verify the, um, the offsets that are created. So um, 
using you know strong data to measure all of the climate impacts and and carbon improvements to then you know uh, work with a third party verifier and then create the offsets through the gold standard registry. Um, and then our transactions team, you know, has very deep experience in the in the carbon markets. Climco has been um, in the carbon and the voluntary carbon space and, and in the compliance carbon space for uh, about 14 years. And, you know, in the past couple of years, we've really seen the market go up and um, our company as a whole has created almost 25 million tons of reductions um, from the activities that, that we've done and helped our clients do. And then we also, our transactions team is very active in the market buying and selling. So it sells uh, around 20 million tons a year of, of carbon credit. So it has uh, strong ties in the marketplace. It has strong relationships with our buyers and, um, and deep experience in how to monetize um, these industrial and hard to abate um, credit types. And so here I'm showing, you know, what's the process look like? So we have um, a process that's really defined primarily through gold standard, this, this big circle, the annual monitoring, reporting and verification cycle. Um, but what, what we are seeing is that these ocean type credits are, are very unique. So that allows us the opportunity to kind of create a new product and, and um, receive premium value for those, for those ocean credits and for the, for the shipping decarbonization efforts. Um, and, and one thing that's exciting about this partnership as well is that we've really also reduced the barriers to join the program. So when you're, um, when you're joining the program, there's a very, small upfront fee, but primarily your fees are paid when your credits are sold. So uh, Climco and Marisoft are, are basically taking on the risk that these, that we're, you know, we're investing our time and we're creating these credits and working with Gold Standard and hiring third-party verifiers and the ship owners basically cover those costs in the crediting period. So they're not, so that we're really reducing the, the barriers and the costs to join the program and to participate with gold standard and to participate in the voluntary carbon markets. Because really the, the voluntary carbon markets are meant to help fund decarbonization activities and to make it economic so that they can increase the impact of, uh, increase the expansion and engagement with ship owners to um, reduce the carbon impacts of shipping and, and other industries as well. Thank you so much uh, for that introduction. And, and, and I, you know, I, 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 as a, on a personal level, I should say I've, I've managed to, to, I think, master the IMO's jargon, uh, but the jargon of the voluntary carbon markets is something else altogether. So the uh, uh, understanding how it works and how to, to make it work for you is really part of the genius uh, that Climco brings to the table. Mm -hmm. Erica mentioned that we're, we've reduced the barriers to entry. And I'm just going to give a very quick financial case study that illustrates how that works for ship owners. And this is based on a 10-ship uh, fleet. Uh, five of those ships are unique. Five of them are sister ships. You only pay for the, the benchmarking program with green screen for the unique ships. And the cost is $25,000 upfront per ship. So there's $125,000 upfront cost. Now, depending on the ship, depending on the retrofit program, you're going to save CO2. How much CO2? We've taken uh, a, an illustration of three tons per day. Uh, bunkers, about 9.3 tons uh, then of CO2 per steaming day. If the ship sails on average, or seems on average 270 days a year, uh, the net cash flow back to the owner is $170,000 a year. And that begins about a year after they enter the program because you need a year of actual operating performance to verify this. That's what Erica showed us in that, that sort of uh, a chart in the previous slide. Now that's based on a, a $10 per ton carbon credit price uh, that reflects the branding, the premium that we expect uh, to be realized if, through this program. We can talk more about where that stands right now if, if there are any questions. Um, but the point I think of the program uh, that we put together is that it, we take the risk out of it by 
taking the, the break-even price, just in terms of this cash flow, down to less than $2 a ton. So we've really tried to uh, uh, establish a, a, a low barrier to an industry-wide solution that we're putting together with, uh, with our collaboration with Kleinfeld. We're not aiming to get 10 ships, we're aim aiming to get 1,000 ships, 5,000 ships. In fact, we think there are more than 10,000 ships that are gonna benefit from this. And so we're looking to ensure that we, we price this at a level that gets them all signed up. Now, this case study is specifically about cash flow, and cash flow uh, is the king. But there are two other important aspects of, of the program which enhance the value. First of all, the gold standard carbon credits are linked to the ship, and they're an objective, science based, op verified, auditable indicator of the emissions reduction delivered by the ship. That's in contrast to CII and all the other schedules of, of benchmarks of performance, which talk about charters and, and how they are uh, using your ship. This shows uh, uh, to that this is a, an indicator that owners can say, look, this is the investment I have made to improve the performance of my ship. And that's portable, it moves with the ship. So it enhances the value when you sell that ship with a green screen gold standard accreditation attached, that's gonna reflect, increase the value when it's sold. But we all know that the key to make, being a success in shipping is to make money with your ships that are 10 years or, or more uh, old. That's the sweet spot. That's how you can uh, really ensure that you have the resources in place to go through that next generation of ships that will actually have zero emissions that will, hope, that will be emerging over the course of the next decade. So we're focusing on enhancing that, the value of those critical assets for owners, not just in terms of cash flow, but in terms of asset value and reputation. So we've tried to summarize quite a bit here. There's a strategic logic, decarbonization. There's a financial logic. This will pay for itself in a year. Uh, and we, we're ready to deliver this at scale for you now. Uh, so we're excited to hear any questions you may have and look forward to, to helping you cross that gold standard pathway. Thank you, Al. Great, thanks, uh, uh, Erica and uh, Arlie. Um, I have to say, Arlie, I think it's probably 18, 24 months ago that you know I first heard of, uh, of the uh, green screen program. And it seems every time I get an update, there's some sort of new exciting development in terms of progress you've made with Gold Standard and now with Climco. Uh, but where are you really with ship owners? I mean, are you making progress with actually impacting um, you know, in the market today? Uh, can you just give a little bit of context as to how many deals have you done? How many ships are we talking about actually in the program? So we've got companies like, like Starbolt, like uh, 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 Golden Ocean, uh, Ridgebury, Prime Marine, they, they all signed up and, and the response has been tremendous. Uh, uh, Eric and I are, are already planning our, our trip to Athens and, and look forward to, to signing up a few more at that time. But we're seeing a lot of interest, both, both I, I think because ship owners see that they're, they face a real dilemma. They don't know how to, to, to uh, what concretely are the, are the right next steps in terms of fuels and engines, but they do know they can retrofit their ships. And if it's possible to get additional support for doing that, well, that just makes a lot of sense. Um, and, and beyond just the retrofits for ships, which are, which are interesting, and, and there's a large universe you know, for that, which, which I think you highlighted, um, isn't the opportunity here uh, bigger? I mean, aren't there things given your expertise and knowledge, you know, early in the, the platform that Climco has that, that can be done uh, outside of just that uh, initial market? Yes, absolutely. And so Arlie and I have been having really interesting conversations with ship owners about what other challenges they're having, what other opportunities they're seeing for decarbonization. And Climco has both a consulting business that helps companies report on their emissions reductions and frankly track all their scope one, two, and three, and then um, create plans of how they're going to reduce. And so we've had a really 
we've had a lot of interesting engagements with our consulting side and our project development side and, and working with uh, Marsoft and the ship owners to address other challenges that they're having. So there's questions around how do we make biofuels economic? There's no, you know, in the U.S., there's a federal renewable fuel standard for on-road vehicles, but it, it doesn't exist for, for marine vessels. So how do we, you know, how do we make that economic? Our customers are asking us to decarbonize. How do we do it? And how do we monetize it? How do we make those investments? So we've had interesting discussions around both biofuels, both how do we report? How do we talk about claims? What claims can we make and not make because of the offsets that we're selling? What does this mean for our customers? How do we communicate to our customers about these, about these changes that we're making in our business, these investments that we're making? Um, and uh, we're also, you know, actually, I had an interesting discussion with Marine Money about um, what about carbon capture? What are these other um, challenges and opportunities and new technologies we're seeing in the marine space? And could voluntary offsets or could um, even direct reductions in a supply chain and a value chain? How do we talk to our customers about that? And how do we create those opportunities? So it's um, it's been very exciting and dynamic and you know as as i said we specialize in the in the hard to abate sector so they have similar challenges to you know a, a cement or a, an, an ammonia producer other uh, industrial players right and, and and since you since you've opened the door a bit with uh with with that topic some of the other hard to abate uh i i, I guess the counter argument to, to what you're doing is an argument that this is greenwashing and that you are just perpetuating the pollution of some of these industries as opposed to, to making them more fundamentally rethink um, their businesses. How, how do you respond? How do you think uh, about that? Uh, do you think those are valid uh, perspectives or uh, is that misguided? You know, that's why we chose to work with Gold Standard and, and, and primarily we work with just kind of four primary registries that are well respected and really a lot of the requirements are around what is the data used, what is the science behind these quantifications, how do we prove that they're additional. And, um, and so, you know, we were, ple we were pleased to work with Gold Standard and, and, and with um, green screen because green screen um, has all the all the data and quantification and modeling behind it and it's really been proven. So Arlie, did you want to talk about the, the proven piece? I, I think the the technology that we're using to verify the savings is, is generating uh, is proving to be accurate, uh, uh, highly accurate in, in countless tests that we've run with various ships. But but how maybe on a, on, a, on a lot larger level, the shipping industry is is deeply committed. The decarbonization, and, and that's true of every conversation I have with principals. They're concerned that they don't want to do anything that might be a misstep. And so we hear that question all that all the time. And, and we walk through the process, we walk through how gold standard gives that investment grade rating to the to the uh, retrofits and, and how they're reporting to verify it. And transparency and reporting is critical. Mm -hmm. um, so there's th this is one part, Al, of, of what ship owners are doing to, to contribute to decarbonization. We know it has to be consistent with all those standards and goals, um, and we can show exactly how it, it, it checks all those boxes. Great. We do have one, I think, quick question from the audience, um, which I think I know the answers to, but I'll, I'll leave it to the experts. Um, and the first part is, uh, you know, is, is this a way to streamline and try to achieve potential carbon credits that may arise from a retrofit to which I, I believe the answer is yes. That's essentially what you are trying to do is streamline streamline the the, the process. Um, so I think that was the easier part. And then the second part is, does it have an impact on the cost or the financing of the retrofits directly? The, the, I'll, I'll take a stab at that. The, the, the retrofits are chosen by the owner. And, and so they'll negotiate they'll, they'll, uh, their own deals. They'll, they'll have relationships to describe that. Uh, we don't see green screen as uh, having a direct impact on, on the uh, cost side, except of course, to the extent that we, we, we are successful in getting that industry scale, we do expect that prices will fall for the more advanced uh, uh, capabilities that are becoming available. Great, well, seeing, uh, seeing nothing else, uh, Arlie and uh, Erica, uh, excited to hear what you two have done together. And I. I can't wait for the next six month update to see what other uh, 
exciting thing you have added to the uh, the program, Arlie. Um, and, and with that, I'll ask our next uh, speaker, uh, Dallas Smith, if uh, he can uh, join us virtually. Thanks very much, Al. Thank you, Arlie. Our uh, next speaker, uh, Dallas Smith, is uh, a retired member of the U.S. Coast Guard, where he oversaw the uh, government's uh, LNG initiatives within that uh, within that branch. And so he brings to the conversation today a lived experience um, at his new role in the Liberian Registry. And uh, he's going to share with us uh, their perspective as one of the leading uh, global ship registries on how they're going to partner with uh, owners and then other authorities to meet the uh, various decarbonization goals. Uh, Dallas? Thanks, Al. Screen. On screen, Dallas, we can see it. Okay, great. Well, uh, thanks for the introduction. I'm uh, very happy to be here. Um, a little bit about my background, as Hal was saying, um, I recently retired from the U.S. Coast Guard, where I ran the Coast Guard's liquefied gas national center of expertise for the last six years. I oversaw the uh, LNG operations. Uh, for gas carriers, gas as fuel, gas bunkering, and uh, gas terminals. I have a very similar role uh, here with the Liberian Registry, uh, leading our global gas team. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, Flag State's role in decarbonization. Uh, things that this, I'm gonna discuss, I'm gonna give you an overview of uh, LISCR or the Liberian Registry, uh, discuss IMO, uh, regulatory uh, framework, some changes to the IGF code and joint industry projects that we've been a part of and some uh, future projects as well. So the Liberian Registry uh, is the second largest flag state in the world. We have over 3,400 registered vessels, uh, which is uh, 230 million gross tons, which gives us 15% of the world's market share. Regarding liquefied gas carriers, we have 55 uh, new builds that are Liberian flag that are under construction uh, in various shipyards in uh, Asia, mainly uh, Korea, China, and Japan. And on the uh, dual fuel front, uh, we have the largest market share of delivered dual fuel vessels on the water. So, in the last uh, few years, the international framework has started to shift from strict regulatory uh, requirements to a goal-based standard, which allows the owners and operators to you know, be innovative and instead of having a rigid framework that they have to meet, it gives the administration, the flag states, the ability to look through risk assessments that are provided uh, to meet certain standards instead of having to meet just strict uh, requirements out of regulations, which uh, allows us to you know, be innovative for, to help meet the uh, new mission requirements and a little bit about the history of that, uh, you know, back in, April of 2018, the IMO um, strategy came out, which aligned with the United Nations uh, to reduce to 40% CO2 by 2050 and uh, a total 50% greenhouse gas emission by 2050. Uh, then IMO MEPC 76 met, which amended uh, Annex 6 of MARPOL, which uh, we've pretty much discussed the EEXI CII and uh, SIMP Part 3, which start going to effect this November. Um, so this, you know, it, it, it's not no longer in the future, it, it's happening now. And this is a slide that uh, I really like. Uh, it actually was back, it came out back in the uh, MEPC 72 meeting where it shows um, where we were at in 2008 with uh, 800 
over 800 million uh, tons of CO2. And the current trajectory, if, uh, you know, if there's no changes, would be over 2,500 uh, million tons of CO2, which the, and then the blue it was at that time, the EDI since also included ED, uh, EXI, which if those changes came out, we would still be almost double to where we need to be. Also with the operational requirements, which was the SIMP and uh, the uh, CII, that would reduce us to here. And then the green is the innovative designs. This is where we uh, can take new technologies, you know, hydrogen, ammonia, uh, methanol, and you know, it'll, it will help push us down to 50%. But then there's also you know, a push from uh, COPE 26 and I'm at IM, IMO MEPC 80 to potentially be uh, zero carbon free. So we really have to, you know, uh, push the envelope on some new technologies and uh, the Liberian registry is very excited to partner with our ship owners, our uh, shipyards, developers, manufacturers to help approve new technologies. Uh, something we've been a part of at IMO, um, started back at IMO, uh, GHG 11 was to push from right now we're looking at basically from tank to wake this is um you know from once the 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 fuel is loaded on the vessel to the emissions we're pushing IMO to consider well to wake so from when it comes out of the ground uh if there's carbon removed and the process to reduce emissions uh, we're, we're pushing to, to get credit for our ship owners. Talking a little bit about our, uh, the JIPs and uh, what comes out of the IGF code, which gives us the authority to, to look at risk assessments. Right out of the IGF code, uh, you can see 2.33 2 alternative designs can be approved by the administration. This is where it will allow us to look at um, additional fuels that the IGF code doesn't address. So with um, ammonia and hydrogen and, and things like that, um, the ship owners and our partners, you know, can submit risk assessments and we can issue AIPs. Uh, since 2016, uh, I think we just issued our 35th uh, AIP through joint industry projects. Uh, which is, you know, very exciting. We're, you know, we're leading the way for as registries. Uh, you know, we've done liquefied hydrogen carriers, uh, liquefied CO2 carriers, uh, ammonia, all different types of new designs. Uh, here's a few photos of some past. We recently had, I was at Gas Tech uh, a few weeks back in Milan. We issued uh, two AIPs there for some new joint industry product uh, projects as well. And uh, we look forward to being able to work with the various stakeholders uh, for new projects in the future. And I look forward to uh, any questions you may have. Great, thank you, uh, Dallas, for uh, a very, uh, very detailed uh, and uh, helpful presentation. Um, since you raised in your presentation the IMO and some of the COP meetings, Curious uh, to hear what you, from uh, the ship register perspective, would like to see the IMO, IMO do uh, to, to sort of accelerate the, the goals or, or make certain that the industry is in a position to achieve the, the targets they're laying out. No, it's, it's a great question. Uh, you know, as you know, Liberia is one of the 175 member states of IMO, and we've submitted various papers to help uh, streamline the process, you know, one of which we recently submitted was for to approve carbon capture to receive credits for correction factors for carbon capture. Uh, we've also, you know, supported the, the, the well to wake and uh, various, various other initiatives. 
Great. Well, seeing there are no, uh, no other questions, uh, Dallas, thanks uh, for joining today. And if I could ask uh, Tristan and uh, Marie to uh, join us. So uh, rounding out the uh, session today, uh, we have with us uh, Tristan Smith and Marie uh, Fricadet, who uh, bring uh, with them an accumulation of studied expertise on uh, climate change and the challenges uh, that, uh, that we face today. Uh, today, uh, we have the privilege of getting a first glance at a newly uh, published report uh, that they have um, that's going to benefit uh, our friends at the Global Maritime Forum focused on uh, the, uh, the LNG sector. So with that, I'll turn it over to uh, Tristan and Marie. Um. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Marie. Very excited to be here today to launch this report, uh, which I wrote with Joseph Teller, Tristan Smith, who's also presenting, and Nishata Pasramatula, on the exploring methods for understanding stranded value. Uh, and we did a case study on LNG capable ships. So uh, there has been already some research uh, in the literature on the risk of stranded asset in other industries. Uh, so typically the power generation or the oil and gas extraction industry. And we, were aim we are aiming with this uh, first study to expand the findings and the methods uh, of this research to the shipping sector to understand first uh, the potential risk of stranded assets in shipping. And, and to do so, we propose a set of methods to assess uh, stranded value risk um, in investments now. So we use those methods on a specific case study, which is LNG uh, capable ships. So this, uh, this case study seemed to be uh, for us a, a good candidate for two main reasons. Uh, first of all, because there has been a large uptake of uh, LNG capable investments recently. Um, so that's on the graph you can see on the left hand side. So essentially the order book uh, is likely to double the existing LNG capacity on waters. Um, and second reason why it's a good candidate is because uh, of its uh, greenhouse gas emissions and because of the long lifespans in general of ships, the LNG fuel ships today will have to move either to a, another zero emission fuel uh, uh, in the future or to disappear from the fleet if we are going to stay within a decarbonization trajectory. So they are at risk of being stranded. Um, now, we to, to use our methods, we, we, we projected the fleet in a hypothetical scenario, which is represented on the right-hand side, which makes two assumptions. Uh, first assumption is that the, the, the investments uh, in LNG capable ships continue and grow uh, up to 2030. So there is a partial transition to LNG as a marine fuel in the coming decade. And second assumption is that in 2030, the pressure uh, from policy to uh, mitigate shipping emissions and to align with the 1.5 degree temperature goals, goal um, increases so that the LNG fuel ships uh, are pushed to uh, move to zero emission solutions. Um, in this hypothetical scenario, uh, we modeled that the LNG capable fleet would be worth uh, $850 billion by 2030. So what would happen to, to, to this amount? Uh, there are several possibilities. First one is uh, that uh, the LNG fuel ships are incapable to uh, move to zero emission solution, for example, if a retrofit is not available. And therefore, the whole amount is at risk of being shredded. On the other hand, if there is uh, dropping fuels, uh, so uh, bio LNG or ELNG available and uh, cost competitive, then you can expect essentially no stranded value at all on the fleet. So we look at the intermediate case, which is what happens if the LNG capable ships are uh, able to retrofit to uh, another um, uh, zero emission fuel. Um, and we, we, we essentially model a devaluation First, if, they if the ships lose their premium compared to conven conventional fuels, especially if uh, it's cost the same to retrofit LNG or conventional to towards uh, zero emission fuels. And second, we look at the devaluation 
if uh, LNG fuel chips uh, in 2030 are in competition with uh, zero emission new builds. So in the specific case where ammonia is the most uh, cost competitive fuel uh, in 2030, uh, our results show that 15 to 25% of the secondhand value of the LNG capable fleet in 2030 would be stranded. Um, and that's, uh, that's an aggregate number. Uh, some individual ships would have a higher or lower risk of being stranded. And uh, on that note, uh, I'll pass it over to Tristan for some concluding remarks. Thank you, Marie. If you could move to the next slide and uh, just tap for the first message. So I, I'm going to start just by reinforcing that point that Marie made. Our, a key assumption that we have here is that the least cost uh, approach for complying with a 1.5 degree pathway is is to retrofit. We've done a lot of modeling of the whole sector's transition pathways out to 2050 and various other studies. And, and what we keep getting from those pathways is that this isn't a transition that you can do just through bringing new builds into the fleet with zero emissions capability. If we do that, we don't get our emissions down quickly enough. And um, so there needs to be something that happens to the vessels which are still uh, being built today and will be built over this decade. Um, you could use a, a drop in fuel, which in the case of LNG, Marie's already mentioned, but when we do our own standalone analysis on that, we get those fuels coming in at 30 to 50% more expensive than uh, the least cost fuel that in most of our studies and most of our scenarios is ammonia. So, so the sectors that has built ships um, to run on LNG this decade has that really difficult problem of either paying premium for a more expensive fuel whilst others are using ammonia or paying the capital cost of the retrofit. And in, and what I'm just emphasizing here is that in our analyses, the, the, the optimal decision tends to be to retrofit rather than go with the more expensive fuel, but that's still a very uh, key area of uncertainty. Next, um, next bullet, please. Um, the analysis that Marie's been leading has looked at the different sources of finance that exist around LNG capable assets today. And what's interesting is that there's still quite a lot of public money, even in, in 2020. Um, some of you may be familiar with the fact that the EU taxonomy is um, legitimizing LNG as a, as a broad um, sector um, to, to be classified as green. And so there's, there's still a confusion, um, even in finance, which should be aligned to kind of government commitments to zero by 2050 or 1.5 alignment. This isn't just about the private financing of LNG capable assets. Next bullet, please. Um, the, the, a key message is that whilst we can see that the ordering is very high at the moment in 2022, um, it's it's increased very rapidly, and so the overall fleet size of LNG capable assets is still quite small. So this isn't necessarily something which means the analysis doesn't mean that assets that have already been ordered that are already in fleets won't have a managed um, pathway through the decarbonisation of the sector. It's more to do with what happens if we don't um, look at what's coming and factor that into the decisions that are being made from now onwards. Next bullet, please. Which, which stresses this message about avoidable surprises. So at what point of confidence in forthcoming IMO regulation or in industry commitments, uh, does that really change the decision on the specification of an investment? And um, a lot of what our group is interested in doing is understanding how we can maximize um, the leverage of both the private sector thinking and the government and policy making, thinking on that to, to make this as as low cost a transition as possible. Um, next bullet, please. Um, and and that's why we're still puzzled. And um, I'm very grateful to Marie's hard work to kind of advance some of the methods in this about exactly what we can imagine the dynamics of asset values might be as we go into this period. We're facing technology uncertainty because we don't know exactly what fuel is going to win as we go through this decade, but we also face policy uncertainty. We don't know the timing of the implementation of stringent policy. We don't know the stringency. Will it push us to zero in 2050? Will it push us to a much deeper decarbonisation sooner than that? It's interesting to hear what previous speakers have said about this because um, a 1.5 aligned pathway is not just zero in 2050, it's a very deep 80, 90% reduction in 2040. So there's really a very small 
amount of um, life left in fossil assets and infrastructure if we are on a 1.5 pathway and and how that impacts asset values when the asset values are much longer than that 18 year period to 2040 is going to be um, still something that we'd like to work on. It might inform what a, what a helpful policy response might be. Next bullet, please. Um, the methods that are in the paper that we um, had launched, I think, consistent, coincident with this presentation. So you can look at the detail. I, we don't think are very hard to implement. They're easy to use. Um, we'd be really grateful for any feedback on how it makes sense to use them and whether it makes sense to use them, either in your own private calculations or in a more sort of transparent method. And finally, um, I think what we learned as we went through this process is that the most important thing for the sector is, is now just to get that policy clarity as quickly as possible, because that's what, you know, that's one of the parameters that informs uncertainty that we should be able to control and um, with concerted effort we could do, but that's an ongoing process. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Marie and uh, Tristan. I, I really look forward to finding an opportunity to dig into some of the work you've done, which sounds like uh, has, has got a lot of interesting approaches. Um, I, I have a number of, of questions, um, but I think we're coming to the end of the session. So I, I guess I'll just ask the one that comes most to mind, which is, uh, I mean, we've just seen an extreme amount of volatility in pricing, particularly around LNG, as well as disparities between different uh, you know, markets in the world, um, given the uh, developments in uh, in Russia and Ukraine and the implications that's had on, on Europeans um, power and uh, industrial infrastructure. How, how do you begin to consider, right, the kind of price volatility that you're seeing in, in this sort of analysis? And, and is that reflected? Is this done before that? Yeah, that's a very good question. No, we we are, we have the luxury of taking a sort of long term, long run view on prices. So we we start with models that actually assume that gas is slightly cheaper than oil, and then that's why you saw in um, Reed's scenario the the significant penetration of LNG this decade. That's also driven actually by CII, not necessarily because it's reducing greenhouse gas emissions, but because that's regulation which is uh, reducing CO two emissions, and LNG does well on CO two. So um, so we can get both that kind of earlier lower price of LNG plus the regulation to create a credible risk. Clearly, with developments in recent um, months, that is no longer so credible and the, and the time period over which we'll have higher, uh, very high gas prices due to that kind of supply demand crunch that we're in um, might well change some of the dynamics of this risk and, and certainly would counter it because it would disincentivize new building as we, if we take a very short-term perspective. But we're more interested in looking at the 5, 10, 15-year perspective on this, where hopefully those dynamics are not material. Great. Well, uh, thank you uh, both again for uh, participating today. And uh, thanks again to all of the uh, other uh, fabulous uh, presenters that we had. And with that, I'll turn it back over to you, uh, Jim, uh, to have any uh, closing remarks that you might uh, might uh, want to share. <clears throat> Hal, thank you very much. Um, and to uh, we've come to the conclusion of the webinar, but I would like to really thank each and every one of our participants profusely, not only for the time and thoughts today, but for their larger contributions to the effort to manage our future emissions so that we leave an inhabitable, equitable and prosperous planet for future generations. Um, I want to conclude by thanking again the High Tide Foundation for their support, uh, the wonderful team at Marine Money, Lorraine and John especially, and to wish the Global Maritime Forum every possible success in their important deliberations in the days just ahead. And to our diplomats within the United Nations and by extension the IMO, we look for your leadership and support as we as an industry tackle the challenges with grit and skill. And thank you again to all of our participants today for their time and for all of you out there who are watching. Until next time, thank you so long. Thank you, Jim. Thanks, Al.